Um, I'm Natalie Walker. I'm the manager of college operations at the Classic Learning Test. Uh, we're joined by five, I believe, five CLT test takers. Some of them are CLT 10 award winners this year. So congratulations to you all, especially. Uh, we look forward to hearing thoughts and questions from each one of you later in the night. Um, real quick, maybe alphabetically, if it would be great if you could say for everyone on the call, just your name and maybe what kind of school you go to. Um, we could start with Alithia. Uh, yes, I'm Alithia West. I am homeschooled, but I take curricula from a wide variety of places, including uh, Veritas Scholars Academy, and I am from Virginia. I am Annalise Stokeman. I am also homeschooled through Classical Conversations, and I am from Texas. All right, and I'm John Gardner. And I, um, I'm i homeschooled, but I use a lot of different places for my schooling. No co-ops, but I've um, switched around between HSLDA, um, other online uh, course offers. Um, and right now I'm taking some courses with the Potter School, which is awesome. Um, and I'm from Johns Island, South Carolina. I'm Lily Ellis. I'm currently going to like my first public school, but it has a very classical model and I've been homeschooled and classical schooled before then. I'm Victoria Gomez. I am also homeschooled and we do it through CC and a couple of other courses and dual enrollment type things. And I live in Virginia. Fantastic. Um, it is always a pleasure interacting with, with our students. Uh, finally, we have the honor of being joined by Dr. Todd M. Thompson, an Associate Professor of History at Tory Honors College, Biola University. Um, I'll put a little more of his biography in the chat for you all. Uh, but Dr. Thompson, before we hear the result of our Achilles poll and then get started, um, would you spend a minute describing Tory and, and what you love there? It's a really special place. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Natalie. Um, I'm really happy I get to join you guys tonight. It's been wonderful to get to talk with these uh, panelists beforehand and hear a little bit about where they're from and their engagement with the text. Um, so very briefly, Tory Honors College is a wild and wonderful way to do your general education at Biola University. So we have um, uh, a whole range of majors and any major that you that you opt for is compatible with Tory in terms of um, you pursue your general education with Tory and you get your major, um, which will be distinct at Biola. Um, we read through, gosh, um, 150 or so uh, great uh, books from um, Homer to C.S. Lewis and everything in between. We do uh, usually about twice a week, um, three hour discussions uh, on those books with an opening question from a tutor, someone like me. And we'll have a cohort of uh, 14 to 16 students that'll be there in a circle and we'll talk to each other and interpret the text together and try to try to land the discussion and, and find a convincing and compelling conclusion. So um, that's that's maybe the gist of, of what we do. We're committed to uh, um, seminar, uh, Socratic discussion. And we're also committed to mentoring. So as you come into the program, you won't just have your uh, 14, 16 member cohort, but you'll be assigned to a mentor in the program um, who will also, you'll see them occasionally in class, but you'll get to have office hours with them and have individual discussions with them through the week. So mentoring is critical in our program. And it's actually where I spend probably the majority of my, my classroom time each week. Or maybe it's a split, maybe 12 hours teaching and about 10 to 12 hours with students in office hours. That's, ama that's an amazing ratio. Uh, that's where that's where an education happens. Um, that's great. Well, I want to get started shortly. So let me end the poll and share it. There we go. Uh, we're about 60-40 on having read the Iliad, which is great. Um, this is a wonderful place to get introduced to it and also to go a little deeper with it. Um, how would you describe Achilles? We're at 26% whiny baby throwing temper tantrum. Two responded godlike, 9%. Um, most of us are taking the more nuanced godlike whiny baby. 
and a close second at cool, but not as cool as Hector. That's probably about, about what I thought it would be. All right. Um, so as we go, put questions in the chat or changes of heart, as you see that Achilles is cooler than Hector, um, as you have them in the chat. Uh, we'll field some of those questions after the lecture for sure. And we also just want to hear what, you, what you're what you thinking. Um, so Dr. Thompson, thank you so much for being here. That's all I have. Uh, take it away. Great. Thanks so much, Natalie. Um, I would, just to start things off, I'll say even as early as, or as recently as probably June, if I would have taken the poll, I would have been on the godlike baby, a whiny baby train um, for sure for Achilles. My reading has changed a little bit in the last three or four months, and I'm going to going to present that uh, to you tonight. So I'll see if I can share my screen here in a second. Before I do start, um, one of my students is uh, has joined us, and I'll embarrass her just really briefly, Emma Luke. Um, she just turned 21, so I want to wish her a happy birthday and say, um, glad glad that you've joined us, Emma, and, and she'll be active, I know, in the chat. So let me share my screen. All right, hopefully you can see that. Is that all right, Natalie? Um, well, let's get started. Uh, I want to I want to um, jump right in, and uh, we'll we'll begin thinking about the Iliad together. So I've I've planned this in uh, a way to condense uh, a Tory Honors College experience in about a 20, 25 minute um, lecture talk, followed by um, a 25, 30 minute interaction with the panelists. So we usually have a three hour discussion. Um, that's prompted by an opening question. And tonight, I just want to give you, um, if I was to ask my own opening question to myself about Achilles, um, how I would answer that. And I also um, need to, to give a bit of a disclaimer. Um, I'm a scholar of 20th century history, and so very interested in the issues um, and personally interested in um, the issues that the Iliad raises. I'm not a scholar of ancient Greek epic poetry. I'm not a scholar of uh, 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 let's say, uh, Homer, but um, I'm thrilled to be with you tonight to tell you about a, my reading of a poem that I love and that I have so enjoyed um, teaching. And I, I welcome um, if you have different reads or if you have uh, pushback that you want to give to some of the points and the textual evidence, that is very welcome. So um, we're, we're just here to have a good discussion, I think, and pursue the text together tonight. Um, so Aside from that general introduction, I have two main goals. Um, one is to entice you to the enjoyment of the poem. I think great stories bring enjoyment. They encourage wonder, they invoke our curiosity, and they entertain. And I want to I want to start there in just a second. But I have also another goal tonight, and this is something that is important to us as a reading community at Tory Honors College, and I suspect important to you and your reading communities that you're a part of as well. Um, I want to help sharpen our attention to the text, and um, I want to seek I want to seek wisdom. I want to seek truth, and I want to help us cultivate that search um, in ourselves as we engage with the text. So I believe, um, I'm convinced that thorough and careful attention to the text, even English translations um, of great stories can offer us wisdom. Uh, they can offer us wisdom about the human experience, and that great stories are not just fodder for debate, uh, but as we engage in debate about their interpretation, um, we do so because we just care deeply about discovering the truth that they might teach us. So that's the approach I'm going to be taking. And in order to accomplish these goals tonight, I want to introduce you to a few exemplary readers of the Iliad whose observations um, have both enriched my enjoyment of the work and they've helped me discover wisdom uh, for living um, today. So we'll, we'll start with a bibliography. I wanna show you some of the works I'll be, I'll be uh, referencing this evening. Um, I'm gonna be drawing on Richmond Lattimore's English translation. That's the one we use in our curriculum. And I'm also gonna be drawing a bit on the Marvel Comics adaptation of the Iliad, which has incredible illustrations by Miguel Angel Sepulveda. Um, I would highly recommend that. Um, I'm also going to be referring briefly to the Trojan War, um, which is uh, everything but the Iliad, about the epic cycle of, of Trojan history. Um, and I'm going to be drawing especially on Jonathan Shea's uh, Achilles in Vietnam, which is a book that has uh, a, a reading of the Iliad side by side with testimonies from combat veterans that Jonathan Shea has worked with as a psychiatrist. 
Um, so it's it's graphic, it's it's explicit, but it's also um, it's also an excellent and provocative read of the Iliad. And lastly, um, uh, two classic essays by Simone Weil, a French philosopher uh, from uh, the pre World War II and kind of World War II era, and Rachel Besfaloff, um, who also wrote a classic essay around the same era. So I just wanted you to be aware of that. You can follow those up after our our seminar concludes if you're if you're curious. And I should I should add um, uh, Eva Brand has an excellent book on Homer Homeric moments, which I, I love and I think is it'd be really fruitful for you to check out as well. Um, so let, let's start here. Uh, joining a conversation. Um, who are these exemplary readers that I have in mind? Um, well, first, uh, I think of I think of Roy Thomas um, when I think of the affinity between Homer and uh, contemporary storytellers. Uh, Roy Thomas was actually the successor to Stan Lee as Marvel editor in chief, and um, he's known for contributions to developing characters and um, superhero teams like the X Men, the Avengers, and of course Spider Man. And he was the co-creator. Thomas was of Wolverine and uh, Vision and Carol Danvers and Ultron and Man Thing and Morbius. If you if you are learned in the lore of the Marvel Cinematic Universe, um, so. Thomas is interesting for us tonight because he called the Iliad his favorite work of literature. And he spent the latter part of his career adapting both the Iliad and the Odyssey um, and also the larger epic cycle of the Trojan War for Marvel Illustrated Comics. And I've had to have those covers there for you to um, for you to see tonight. Um, so his work, I think, is a pretty faithful uh, distillation in comic book form of these great works. And um, I, I would commend it to you. Um, and I want you to think briefly as, as we're thinking about um, Marvel Comics and the Iliad, I want you to think about your favorite stories. Um, what are some of your favorite stories outside of uh, classic you know, Greek epic? How did the stories grab your attention? Um, I wanna to talk to you about an ancient storytelling technique first that we find in the Iliad. So there are many different ways to capture an audience's attention and cultivate their interest. And one of the key story, storytelling techniques that we see in the Iliad and in other epic poems in general involves, involves starting in the middle of a story or in the middle of, an, of, of action. And uh, we see this um, first in, uh, I think uh, here, here in the slide, I wanted to mention Indiana Jones, um, Raiders of the Lost Ark. If you're familiar with this movie, you know that it starts with this very interesting and entertaining sequence where Indy is on his way to recover this idol um, in uh, South America. And this kicks off the story, but it also kicks off the franchise. And we have um, also uh, an example of an epic uh, movie starting in the middle of the action with um, Star Wars Episode Four. There you see Princess Leia um, giving a message to the robot R2-D2 um, connected to the rebel plans that, that or the, the, um, the plans that were taken by rebel spies concerning the Death Star. And uh, you see in the middle, um, or you see in the, in the beginning, um, Darth Vader is, is, is seeking out these, these plans. Um, but it's also as a movie, it's, it's the middle of his story. Um, so many of the other Star Wars stories are concerned about telling the arc of Darth Vader's life, how he gets to um, episode four and then afterwards. Um, so the Iliad also starts us off in the middle of the action. Uh, we, we are 10 years into the Trojan War by the time we get to the first lines of the Iliad. And there, there are only hints in the poem as to how the Trojan War began. And the poem actually, the, the Iliad ends abruptly without fully resolving the stories of the main characters. There's no death of Achilles, there's no Trojan horse, as you might have been expecting, and there's actually no fall of Troy. Um, it ends with the, the um, burial or the, the mourning of Hector by the Trojans. So uh, we see um, the Iliad employing this ancient technique of starting in the middle of things, which is still very successful today. And I think um, the Marvel Cinematic Universe employs this as well. And you'll see Iron Man there um, to the left of the screen. That was the first movie to kick off the Marvel Cinematic Universe. It's kind of the Iliad of the MCU. 
And that was in 2008. And you see movies stretching backwards and then beyond. And the Iliad um, in ancient Greek times kicked off um, a whole sequence of what we call the epic cycle of stories uh, about the Trojan War and the history of that war that happened both after and before the action that we're going to be looking at. So uh, I want to shift a little bit now um, and get get a little closer to our theme um, tonight in terms of how we're going to look at Achilles. And I want to talk to you about two other exemplary readers that I think have been uh, um, really uh, exercised an influence on the way that I, I read and, and think about this epic poem. Um, first is Simone Weil, and she wrote a famous essay on the Iliad called The Iliad is a Poem of Force right before World War II. And she found the Iliad one of the greatest works to help her understand the disorientation that she was facing as um, the Nazis uh, were uh, aggressive and invading various countries in Europe. And this is a quote from her essay on the Iliad. For those dreamers who consider that force, thanks to progress, uh, would soon be a thing of the past, the Iliad could appear as a historical document. For others whose powers of recognition are more acute and who perceive force today as yesterday at the very center of human history, the Iliad is the purest and the loveliest of mirrors. And I want to reflect with you tonight the way in which Achilles might actually be a mirror for us. Um, Jonathan Shea, who's a psychologist, takes uh, Simone Weil's insight even further, and he, he used it to develop treatment techniques for post-traumatic stress disorder uh, amongst the combat veterans from Vietnam that he spent his life and his career um, helping and seeking to, to help heal. He says the story of Achilles and the Iliad is also the story of many combat veterans, both from Vietnam and from other long wars. And so uh, not only is it a story about an ancient soldier, but he's saying this, this story actually speaks to modern warfare in, in significant ways. So I'm going to offer you a reading of the text now to elaborate on, on Shay's insight. And I'm drawing from Shay's work as well as, as Ve and others. So the very beginning of the Iliad tells us what the main theme of this poem is going to be about. The first two lines, seeing goddess, the anger of Peleus' son Achilles, and its devastation. So we we have a clear signal that this is the, the main theme, but it's not the only theme of the poem. And this takes us to the heart of what I want to explore for you tonight, and that's the transformation of Achilles through the poem. And I think the poem is a fantastic way for civilians to begin to empathize with the traumatic experiences of soldiers, which I think is an important skill for uh, citizens in a democracy. And it's also uh, a wonderful work, uh, the Iliad is, that can help people from all kinds of experiences to understand their own responses to moral betrayal, as well as loss and grief. And I think in, in today's polarized environment, and, and we have ongoing conflicts and we have ongoing um, school shootings um, happening throughout America, but also throughout the globe in terms of the uh, military conflicts. These kinds of reflections are essential for us. So the Iliad remains, I think, for 21st century Americans like us, a central text. And for, for people coming from anywhere else on the globe tonight, I also think it speaks to your, your experience. And we want to understand why humans um, perpetrate acts of extreme violence. And we can't do this without considering the ways in which loss and grief affect human beings. So we're going to look at the way in which loss and grief affects Achilles tonight. And I want to begin us uh, off like our, our proper discussion of the Iliad tonight with an opening question. So I might, uh, I might ask an opening question uh, like this. Um, Oh, sorry, I'll, I'll, I'll skip back for a second. Um, I might ask an opening question like this for my for my seminar uh, on, on the Iliad. Um, how do we move from a grieving process that isolates and devastates to one that connects and restores? And in particular, I'm thinking of this um, about Achilles. Like, how does he shift from the first position to the second? So... Uh, Let's let's 
open up with just a, a brief reflection. I'm not going to take you through all of this because I want to make sure we have time for the other material. But um, just a reminder that from the Iliad, we get glimpses um, in moments where we see the death of a minor character in, in tragic ways. We get sometimes three, sometimes five lines that speak about this character's experience outside of war. And through these glimpses, we see the world at peace. And we understand that there's something beyond the conflict that we're seeing in the Iliad. And it, and it foregrounds the conflict is especially tragic because it's something that draws us away from these goods of a world at peace. And there's a, a especially touching line where Achilles is pursuing Hector near the river Scamandrus. And there's an aside from the poet Homer, and he, he tells us of spaces alongside the river where the wives of the Trojans and their lovely daughters were washing clothes. Um, that this, this used to be what happened alongside the river, not this violent conflict. Um, our first sub-question, I think, to answer, if we're going to try to take a, take a stab at answering the opening question, is did Agamemnon wrong, did Agamemnon wrong Achilles? And uh, I want to start with a comment from Sarpedon, who's a lord of the Lycians, he's son of Zeus, to Glaucos, who's the second in command of the Lycians. He says, Glaucos, why is it that you and I are honored before others with pride of place, the choice of meats and the filled wine cups in Lycia? All men look on us as if we were immortals, and we were appointed a great piece of land by the banks of the Xanthos, good land, orchard and vineyard, and plow land for the planting of wheat. Therefore, it is our duty in the forefront of the Lycians to take our stand and bear our part of the blazing battle. So I think he's saying that we fight for honor um, here. We fight for honor. And therefore, it's our duty as those who fight for these highest of honors to take part in the forefront of the combat. And Achilles, as he, as he discusses um, and, and responds to Agamemnon, um, presents his wrong as one of being dishonored. So um, to give you a brief recap of Achilles' story, he, uh, up to this point of the dishonoring by Agamemnon, he's led efforts to discover the cause of a plague at the start in book one, and that's ravaging the Achaeans. Agamemnon has abducted a, a daughter of the priest of Apollo, and um, nobody really knows why the plague is happening, but Achilles is going to help find out. And as they discover more, um, they find that Agamemnon must begrudgingly return this daughter of the priest of Apollo. And in response, Agamemnon seizes Achilles's war prize to recompense his own loss. And may maybe this is a foreign morality to us. It seems really strange, but I think we can recognize with the help of the text that Agamemnon has just violated the moral order that's actually holding the Achaean army together. So it's a betrayal of the right, as Jonathan Shea talks about. Uh, and, and Achilles, um, he talks about his dishonor, and he mentions um, in several points in the poem later on, uh, speaks of himself as a dishonored vagabond because Agamemnon has taken this prize. And what do other people think about this in the poem? Um, we don't just have Achilles' witness, but we have Athene, who calls this an outrage, what Agamemnon has done to Achilles. We have Nestor, who, who is one of the eldest, one of the wisest figures in this whole poem. He says, I have kind intention to both of you, Achilles and Agamemnon, um, as he speaks, but he asks Agamemnon to give back the girl, Briseis, um, to Achilles. And we have Thetis, who is, of course, Achilles' mother, and she asks Zeus for restoration of Achilles's honor. We have Odysseus defending Agamemnon's kingship, but not defending Agamemnon's actions towards Achilles. Um, we have Thersites, uh, who accuses Agamemnon of dishonoring Achilles. And we have Diomedes, who maybe captures our gut reaction to Achilles. He says, Achilles is a proud man um, um, and overly pri prideful, but he doesn't defend Agamemnon's actions. And finally, and I think this is probably the key bit of evidence, Agamemnon admits he, he did wrong. In book nine, he says, I was mad. And he speaks of his heart's evil. 
and a desire to make amends for taking the war prize of Achilles. So I think we have to start by saying, yes, Agamemnon did wrong Achilles, and in fact, it was a significant wrong. Um, how does this affect Achilles? Well, there's, a, uh, I think, a shrinkage of Achilles's world. Um, he's beginning to uh, respond by physically and socially withdrawing in a way that he used to care for the whole army. When there was a plague, he was the first to step up to try to help. He had been one to push for solution. Now he's physically and he's socially withdrawn. And he leaves the Achaean assembly to sit beside his ships and he pledges to refrain from combat. And I don't think this is a reflection of some sort of um, moral code for him. I think it's a reflection of actually grief and loss. I think this is a disordered response in his soul. Um, he's hurt. And he adopts an us versus them mentality when Phoenix, who's one of his closer advisors, comes to actually speak to him. Uh, he says this to Phoenix, who's who's um, re he, he's an envoy from Agamemnon trying to make peace. This is what Achilles says to Phoenix. It does not become you to love this man, Agamemnon, for fear you turn hateful to me who love you. It should be your pride with me to hurt whoever shall hurt me. So it's it's me or him, Achilles tells tells Phoenix. And Achilles, in some ways, um, the world shrinks even more for him after this encounter. It becomes just he and Patroclus alone um, who, who are the social world for him. So I think the army itself is also demoralized. Um, they flee with alarming rapidity when Agamemnon tests them. If you remember this in book two, he tells them to go home after he, he has the, the dream from Zeus and only Odysseus is able to rally them back to the battlefield. So I think following Agamemnon's betrayal of the moral order that's holding the army there and together, um, this is the reason they fight, we can see that Achilles' rage actually ruptures the social order of the army. And it's important to emphasize that the rage is solely directed to Agamemnon and not Hector at this point. So what happens when you add yet another grief? to Achilles' experience. Um, well, Patroclus is Achilles' uh, key advisor and supporter, and how does his death further affect Achilles? Um, Patroclus and Achilles have fought together for 10 years as soldiers. They grew up together. Patroclus is described by Homer as Achilles' true friend. They have a genuine friendship. Patroclus is gentle, he's strong, and he's also Achilles' most trusted companion. And we have ample testimony before the death of Patroclus that Achilles actually is, is respectful towards the dead. Um, he's moderate to his enemies. He much prefers to ransom them into slavery rather than killing them in retribution. That, again, that may seem like a foreign morality to us, but I think there's a significance to that. Um, there's testimonies about, about him ransoming people rather than um, killing them. And these people often find their way back to their families. Um, and he also respects um, respects dead bodies in battle. Um, but after Patroclus's death, um, we see that uh, something changes. Um, when when Achilles learns of Patroclus's death, Homer tells us the black cloud of sorrow came over his eyes, which is very interesting because that's how he describes death for many other characters, the black night coming over the eyes of people. Um, so Homer might be suggesting to us that there might be a moral and a spiritual death, if not a literal death happening for Achilles at this point in time. And that's in book 18, if you want to look at that lines 22 through 24. Um, and Achilles, in a very revealing moment in book 18, talks about the layers of emotion that he has now and his, uh, his desire that the war would just vanish. Um, he says in book 18, I wish that strife would vanish. Um, I wish that gall would go away. I'm just going to paraphrase this. Um, but he also says this paradoxical thing that anger is sweeter to him by far than the dripping of honey. So it's addictive to him. Um, and he talks about the way Agamemnon has wronged him, but now Hector has done the chief wrong. And uh, he gives us a, one last testimony and um, that I'm going to touch on in, in book 21, Achilles says that before Patroclus's death, it was the way of my heart's choice to be sparing to my enemy. 
Uh, many I took alive and I ransomed them. Now there is no one who can escape death. So something is flipped in Achilles's mind. Apollo tells us that now no longer um, can Achilles actually feel justice. He has no feelings for justice. He's a lion. He's become beastly. Um, so there's been a change. And I think he's been dehumanized. His character has been undone by the two losses that he's experienced. Um, Natalie, how are we doing on time? Briefly, I don't have a, a way to track that. Can you give uh, me just an estimation. Yeah, we have we have half an hour. Okay. Um. So I'm gonna I'm gonna I think land the plane, um, and and then I want to leave us plenty of time to discuss. So I'm gonna I'm gonna leave the the rest of the material I've prepared, um, for uh we we can discuss it if we want we can draw it on it if we want but I want to give our student panelists plenty of time to interact with what I've just talked about. So here's a here's a preliminary conclusion for us, and then I'll share um, a few questions that I have outstanding um, that I haven't touched on, and the panelists are welcome to interact um, or offer their own observations. So I think with the death of Achilles's close friend, we see the final rupture of social attachments and moral order for Achilles, and this leads to I would argue a kind of spiritual and moral death for him where he can, no longer, uh, he can no longer feel justice in his breast, as Apollo says. And it results in a loss of care um, for himself and a loss of natural fear, a loss of restraint, estrangement from other mortals and their social and moral world. And Achilles re-enters battle after the death of Patroclus. He re-enters battle with no restraints whatsoever. And I don't think Homer's praising this. I think Homer's presenting the tragedy of this. Achilles is devastated morally and spiritually within, and he brings physical devastation now to all those around him as he goes berserk on the battlefield. So I'm gonna stop there um, and we'll, we'll turn it over to our panelists for thoughts. Um, here's a few questions. What does it mean to go berserk? Um, I think I think Homer has has an interesting take on this. Another question: Can Achilles recover morally and spiritually? Um, I think this is a vital question for us to consider. Can Achilles recover morally and spiritually from this sort of moral and spiritual death that I've described? And um, let's see. Would you like me to go ahead and and stop sharing at at that point, um, Natalie, so we can see the panelists? Or yeah. shall I? Yeah, that'd be great. All right. Thanks. So feel free if you have comments or questions, you can you can jump right in. So I do have a question. Um, you mentioned that he obviously through the entire thing is this theme of his rage. Do you, would it, you agree with the idea that um, his rage kind of stems from a sense of apathy that he kind of acquires after like losing so much? I think that's a really interesting question, Victoria. C can you say a little bit more about the apathy, um, how that apathy comes from the loss? I think that's a very interesting connection you're suggesting. Yeah, I just felt like I heard you say a lot about how he kind of loses this desire to have like any self-control or show mercy to his enemies. And to me, I don't know if that just connected with the idea of like apathy and not really caring and lose. And for him, that looked like losing the ability to control his anger and to like have emotional restraint with that sort of thing. Yeah. Thank, thank you for that. Um, yeah, I think apathy is actually a really good word. Um, he hasn't, maybe we could describe it as an apathy for the good of um, his connections with other soldiers and with other parties of Achaeans, um, his his commitment to uh, to win back Helen um, for the sons of Atreus, Agamemnon and Menelaus, and um, his commitment even to fight uh, for his Myrmidons. So I think he's, I, I think he's his sense of duty that we saw with Sarpedon and Glaucon. They said our duty comes from from the desire to fight for honor. Um, his ability, Achilles' ability to fight for honor, has been taken away by Agamemnon, or it's been it's been betrayed. And so I think 
Achilles, his duty, his sense of commitment to the others around him, he becomes maybe apathetic or it's, it's uh he no longer has a desire for, for that. Does that, does that answer your question? Yeah, totally. Thank you. That's really yeah. insightful. I think um, one of the wonderful things about this poem is um, it, it's so realistic, right? Like we could see this scene happening in the real world, but also it, it scales down, right? So um, to kind of explain what I mean, um, we're all of the age where our friends are starting to do that like boy girl kind of thing. Um, and I've had a few friends who've gone through um, some some painful uh, breakups and every time that happens they go through a period of a few weeks for some even um, like a month or two uh, where they just don't care about their surroundings they get very far behind in school they start doing stupid things um, and so that's one of the things that um, that that could be going on in um, in, in Achilles's world is that he has tied his identity so much to his relationship with Patroclus that um, when he loses that relationship, uh, he he does he loses his life, so to speak. I just give a really brief response, and Annalise is going to um, want to jump in. I just want to say that's a wonderful illustration. I think that's that's very apt, John. Thanks for bringing that in, Annalise. You want to. Sorry, I think that's a really interesting point um, that you brought up, John. And something I've seen discussed before is potentially Patroclus as almost representative of Achilles or Achilles's, depending on how we're saying it today, I don't know, um, his humanity. It's almost that he is his heel at some level, um, where once that, that, because if you think about it, Achilles has been raised as the superior force in just about everything. He's always been the best. As a child, he was a prince. He was a fantastic runner. He wins whatever he starts. He has, you know, all these people clamoring for his attention all the time. He's never been forced to be a normal mortal person. He has always been able to overcome anything in his life. And so Patroclus um, is one of the few things that the loss of him, he can't overcome that by any level of divine power, superiority in any way, shape, or form. He is mortal, and he has to come to terms with that. And it's, I feel like Patroclus is almost at some level really his his humanity here, because after that he goes full, you know, divine wrath. At that point, he he rejects his humanity. You know, I am. Um, he says there could be no no bargains between lions and men and stuff. Um, He's he's literally verbally rejecting it the minute Patroclus passes. What do we what do we think there? Like is almost do we think that Patroclus's death is almost what stripped Achilles down to his absolute core more than anything? If I could a, oh, jump in. Yeah, just one angle on the way in which Patroclus might be Achilles' humanity. I'm not going to have the reference at the tips of my fingers, but um, he describes how Patroclus was going to finish his life for him, basically. He was going to raise his son, and he was going to rule his land. Um, so I think at least, I don't want to limit it, like he also just loved Patroclus um, as a friend and as a man, but I think one angle is that this is Achilles having to confront his own death and mortality that he knows is right around the corner. Yeah, I think it's a great question you ask Annalise. And I, I like I like the way you characterize their relationship and um remembering too that um Patroclus is is an elder, like he he's older than Achilles. Um so he's He's got age and he's uh, um, there, there's there's maybe perspective that he's brought to the life. I think that that just kind of adds evidence to you, to your point. I really like your point, Natalie. And I, I've just written this down um, to go chase up afterwards and, and find in the text. 
I also had a question and uh, because the word in that quotation that you had uh, about duty and the sense of fighting for your own sense of honor, it reminds me of this Latin word. Uh, it takes a couple forms, fos, fatum, and it's special in the sense that you are unable to fully translate it. In, in essence, it means that it's this divine sort of will that even supersedes the gods. The gods are themselves bound to this ideal of fate. And so it's used in key moments, and I'm thinking of the Aeneid, where he says that it is Fos that the walls of Troy will rise again in Latium. And so I was wondering if that sense of duty is something that is felt purely internally to, to seek their own glory, or if it's even something viewed so highly as a divine mandate. And if so, that might explain why Achilles has such a dramatic explanation. Because if it's something internal, the modern audience might think, oh, well, he's being dramatic. But if someone's basically stolen your divine mandate from you to seek glory, that is something that we can understand a little bit better. So what's your perspective on that? It's a fantastic question. And thanks, thanks for bringing in um, uh, the Latin for us to, to highlight, I think, the issue. So your, your distinction is between like an internal kind of individual um, motive or a divine imperative. And I think at the very least, if, if we don't have a divine imperative, the internal motive is not just individual. I think it's a it's a shared social commitment. And I think it's it's something we see um, both amongst the Achaeans, it's it's cross-cultural and the Trojans. So it's a cross-cultural, social, socially binding commitment. It's not just individual, though I though I think it is internal. And and I'm not sure if if the panelists have any insight. I don't have any insight just yet. Um, but I think it could be. You you could make the argument that it is also divinely mandated in, in some sort of way. Um, but I don't have my finger on a text for that. I wonder if others have have insights or thoughts. I love the question. Um, so as long as we're talking about that section, um, at least from the, the section of the expert, uh, excerpt um, that I saw, um, I found it interesting how uh, the two men were talking about the, their duty to fight, um, because it seemed like there were uh, one of two possible duties that they could be talking about, and it might have even been both. Um, so there was the one where they're uh, defending their honor as the sons of Zeus, right? Um, the excerpt starts with why, um, which implies that it's going to end with the why or something to do with that. Um, but it also might be out of gratitude uh, because the whole section that starts with why is talking about um, uh, all the different ways in which uh, the people honor them. And so it, it might be uh, a, a less deep sense of just these people have given us this um, and we should lead them into battle, fight with them, fight for them. John, I was I was looking up the text when you were making your point. Could you clarify really briefly for me? Um, I think other people will have heard, but I just want to make sure I'm tracking um, what you think is that is at stake in that conversation about honor, like why they're fighting. You said for gratitude, and what was the alternative? Uh, so the alternative was the one that was that seemed more likely, and it's the fact that they're. Um... They're demigods. I mean, they're sons of Zeus, um, and they have the honor that goes with that. And maybe that's what they're trying to defend uh, rather than gratitude. Or maybe it's just gratitude or maybe a mix of the two. So. Great. I think I think I froze, but I, I caught the I caught the crucial part. Lily, did you did you want to jump in? Um, I saw you unmute for a second. Um. It was about something else, but not about the particular thing that we're talking about right now. So I was just waiting. Great. Well, let me just briefly respond to John. Um, so are, are you connecting, John, the idea of them being sons of Zeus with them having a special divine mandate that may be different? Like maybe they share it with Achilles, but they don't share it with with other soldiers who may not have that, that, that divine genealogy? Um, or do you see it as something maybe more all-encompassing? affecting 
all soldiers despite their genealogy i was i was wondering about that i'm sorry i don't understand exactly um what you mean by that but uh, oh. can you explain a little further i'll try to get an answer. No, no problem i spoke really fast i was wondering if the duty to pursue honor was just a duty for the sons of zeus or like non-sons of zeus would also have this duty to as a divine mandate so um i'm thinking of it less as a divine mandate as opposed to um this is our position among men like they gave us this grant of land they treat us like kings um and so we we're kings we have to lead our men into battle uh, but but then there is also the sense of divine duty perhaps um and then there's a, a sense of gratitude to the people as opposed to um honor among the people that they might be defending so that's a really helpful clarification thank thank you for um for for response Lily, did you have a a different tack i know you haven't got to to share insights or a question yet Essentially, what I was wondering is about like this plague that came over the land when something about the gods had been dishonored. Because in Oedipus Rex, a very similar thing happens. And if you haven't read Oedipus Rex, it's a story of a man who is condemned to kill his father and marry his mother. And no matter what he does, he has to fulfill that destiny. But he doesn't actually know that. So because he killed his father and didn't know it, a plague comes over the entire land and he's seeking this out and in greek tragedies usually the hero has this kind of like fatal weak spot almost so it seems like one achilles grief has kind of over this dishonor has kind of poisoned the whole military he see he went and sought out this beginning of a plague and he found it. And then when he was dishonored, the dishonor spread throughout everything. And also I'm wondering, I don't really know whether this is a tragedy or not, but what his fatal weakness is with this. That's wonderful to bring in Oedipus um, as, a, as a comparison and good good insights about uh, like the idea of a, a plague, kind of a contagion or a poison spreading out from there, affecting um, not just Achilles, but the whole army. And I think the only the, the only thing that I might adjust about it is to say I, maybe Agamemnon triggers this contagion um, rather than Achilles. Achilles not so much by searching, but Agamemnon by disrespecting um, uh, the priest of Apollo. And you, you, Lily, you may have a different take on that, or maybe that's what you were getting at too. I'm not sure. Um, what is what is Achilles's fatal weak spot? Is that kind of what you were wondering? Like, is there a, is there a fatal flaw? Um, and I'm I'm reluctant to say there's kind of one. Uh, it's it's it maybe the college professor in me um, that that wants to kind of resist the um, kind of boiling you know Achilles down to one fatal flaw. But if you push me, um, if you really push me, uh, it, it seems like it's his. Um, maybe not so much his rage uh, at Agamemnon, but it's his sense of, um, his sense of, I think, not his sense, but his his deep sorrow. Um, and I don't know that it's, at Patroclus's death, which I do think is the decisive thing for him. And I don't know if that's so much a fatal flaw as it is just a human characteristic when we lose someone that is so close to us. So, um, yeah, I think, I think it's his sorrow and his deep sorrow that is, is partly his undoing, but I also think there might be a bit of a recovery for him at the end as well, when he gets to communalize his grief in the funeral games and in the morning with his fellow Achaeans and in that really poignant moment with Priam. I think you could almost say that that sorrow was his Achilles heel. Another thing I was thinking about um, during your question, Lily, and Dr. Thompson's response is at the beginning, just how parallel Achilles and Apollo are. Um, we're told that Achilles is going to devastate the Achaeans, but then the first thing we see is Apollo devastating the Achaeans. 
both because they were insulted by Agamemnon. Um, and and Apollo is called the killer from afar. Um, he who strikes from afar because he shoots arrows. And it's kind of nice that that's true of Achilles too, right? He, in fact, that's how he destroys Achaeans is by being far away physically. Um, so he looks he looks a lot like a god at the beginning of the poem, like a specific god, Apollo. I think this relates to a question we have in the Q and A from Micaiah. Um, I'll go with her her last version of it. She's wondering if we're to think Achilles could have taken another approach to his deep emotions that would have been healthier. Like, is that a fair way of thinking of it? Or is, is this tied to higher themes of fate, culture, or character? Um, and are there, are there readings where it had to sort of have happened this way? It's a really thoughtful question, and I wonder if the panelists um, want to jump in. I'll just give a really brief response. I think we do see other characters who may not, maybe don't experience the magnitude of the loss that Achilles does, um, but they are able to maintain their restraint in the context of warfare. I think uh, Odysseus is one. Um, he he doesn't go berserk with the wicked fury, trying to inflict an evil death um, on others as Achilles does. And I think Diomedes maybe is an interesting case of a soldier who, um, who though maybe fighting heroically, may also be more restrained. So I think we get models of people who respond to the stress of combat and the trauma of violence maybe in different ways than Achilles does. I'm not sure. I'm not sure that we get any sense from Homer's poem that uh, Achilles could respond any other way that he has. But I do think it's interesting that the poem doesn't end with him just devastating the, uh, the Trojan army and Hector's body while also wrecking a ruin in his own soul. Um, but we get a sense of some sort of recovery of uh he's called pitiless and justiceless by apollo achilles is um earlier in the poem but in the priam scene priam says he recovers his pity or he has recovered his pity and maybe he's recovered a little bit of his justice yeah and as we kind of talked about earlier achilles hasn't had to go through very many hard things in life as he's like been successful at everything he's tried and it's always kind of come naturally to him and grief is like something you learn to process and we can experience loss like not only on a battlefield like there are so many other ways that that can happen so because he's not really been exposed to it I would say that also made him like weaker and more susceptible to like attacks of intense bouts of grief Whereas maybe some of his comrades who are also dealing with the same thing have kind of had it in smaller doses and so have kind of learned to process through that. I don't know, that's just an idea. That's really interesting. Victoria, I have a question piggybacking off of that, off of what you just said with where he actually hasn't been exposed to that. That's a very interesting point. And I have to wonder um, whether his childhood almost played into it in a different way than I had previously thought about. I wonder if potentially he just has not been taught how to have human emotions or how to process them really because he's never had to. I mean his his father probably wouldn't have been particularly involved in this. His his the people around him would have been constantly just trying to build him up because he's the prince and they need his favor. Um it's kind of going a little bit off of the question in there with the stereotype of the hypermasculine warrior, not necessarily the hypermasculinity, but just the actual lack of any any basis of any experience model for something to follow. He he just, maybe he just has no idea. I don't know. Off of what and least in this whole discussion, I was beginning to think that we've kind of been treating the point of Patroclus's death as the point where he loses his humanity. That's when he truly goes berserk. 
but maybe under this interpretation that even from his childhood and from birth, he has not been taught how to feel proper emotion. And many people would consider learning how to process your emotions properly being one of the key elements of being human, being mortal. Maybe his entire life, he has never been treated as a human. And this moment of Patroclus's death was not him losing his humanity, but losing his last chance at it. Patroclus was probably one of his only mentor figures who would have been able to teach him how to handle his emotions. And by losing that, he doesn't necessarily lose, like shed his humanity all in one go. He just knows that there's no chance for him to lead that normal life because there's, you know, that curse there where it's like, oh yeah, if you go to Troy, you'll be destroyed. But if you don't, you will lose glory, but you will have a happy life. And so there's also that impetus that he doesn't just lose his life in that moment. He loses that promise of happiness if he just gives up his fame and becomes a normal human being. I like the the questions about his upbringing and how that actually affects him. I think that's really, that, that, I, I, I'm, I'm trying to think of places in the text where that could be fruitful to, to, to trace down, but I wanna put one more thing before our attention. And um, I think it's reflective of a, a, a decision point for Achilles, and he actually seems to make a good decision um, at this point. He he's just he's just killed Hector. Um, he's mutilated his body, or is 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 uh, kind of in the wake of that. And he could press on to Troy and attack um, the walls, but he makes a decision. Um, he says, I, "I'm of two minds, but I think it's most important that." And this is my paraphrase that we mourn Patroclus right now. So he pauses and he, he he steps away from the battle and he decides that he will enter a communal mourning process. And I think this is the beginnings of a recovery of some justice in his soul. And so whatever he whatever his decisions are up to that point, there's, there's I think, uh, we don't get much of his deliberative process, but I think that's indicative that he isn't just uh, that he isn't wholly immature. Like he's been, may, maybe he's seen after 10 years of warfare, the value of communal experiences of mourning. And so he chooses that rather than press further in the battle. I have, sorry, a quick question. I know we're kind of running short on time, but you mentioned that um, Achilles, after he killed Hector and everything, it kind of just made me think of, when he was mutilating his body, the fact that Hector was wearing Achilles' armor, that happened through like a whole bunch of transactions. But do you think that has any significance for like Achilles wrestling with like his humanity and processing all that? The fact that Hector was kind of wearing his armor, which would have been super significant for him as like a soldier for who he was like on the battlefield. I've probably talked enough. I'm going to throw this to the panelists and see if any of them um, want to get in a last word as we head towards the close. That's a fantastic question, Victoria. Um, that's super thought provoking. Um, could you expand a little bit more on what you mean there with how he's wrestling with his own humanity through um, degrading Hector's body with his armor? I'd, I'd really love Yeah, sorry, this is kind of like, I guess, a long question that would require lots of context to like throw in at the end. But I was kind of just asking, like, do you think that has significance? Or is it just another like I don't think anything is accidental in this like awesome epic but is that as significant as you could potentially read into it where he is kind of embodying maybe a part of Achilles or who he was I don't know if that makes any more sense but yeah I forget who the play the uh, playwright was who wrote um something to the extent of uh, if you see a gun on the wall in Act 1, uh, it's going to be used to shoot someone in Act 2. And what he means is um, art, um, artists, authors, playwrights, no one throws anything in by accident. And it's all going to have purpose and there's going to be a point. So uh, there certainly is meaning to it. 
Uh, whether it's a deep meaning, I can't really speak to that. I'd never really thought of it before, to be honest, but um, I think we, we can rest assured that there is some significance to it. I think it's a great, it's a great example of a healthy reading habit of being really imaginative. Um, like the poet is presenting you with images. So you might, you might as well spend time with them as images. So the image Achilles looking at a man whose facial features, you can't see at all. Really. You can't see anything about him. All he sees is his own armor. Um, that's very sought after and very unique. Um, so yeah, it's Achilles looking at a sort of avatar of himself and then knowing the weak spot in that armor because it's his and finding it. So killing the the man that looks like himself <laughs> uh, it seems pretty profound to sit with and maybe tough to draw out exactly what we're supposed to do with it. But I think just the just the sitting with it and imagining it does a lot. Annalise? I think um, one, I think what John was referencing earlier, unless I'm mistaken, is Chekhov's gun, um, which is a super interesting point. But I think it does, again, kind of come back to that that flat out rejection of who he was that he portrays in books uh, really 20 through 24, especially. Um, he's constantly saying, again, things that for the time in context would have been very, very specifically um, a, a rejection of who he was, of his humanity, of all his previous identity, really. He's rejecting especially um, the laws that govern humanity, which is something that I've come across in further research is where, um, especially when he's talking about, you know, when he says to Hector, like, I, I would, that my rage would drive me now to rend your flesh and eat you raw. Like that's, that's something he very specifically could not have done without angering the gods as a mortal. Um, he is flat out rejecting everything. And so I think that's, kind of proving Victoria's point there. Yeah, it's kind of got to be significant at some level because it is um, an illustration of very specifically things that he flat out says verbatim later. But it's interesting because like this, like mutilation of Hector in his own armor comes right before what seems like the start of the restoration process. So if that is intended to be the final blow on his own humanity, but then he goes and right after has this like communal warning thing, like beginning to heal. Then that lends it, that lends it an additional layer of being. What does this mean? This is complicated. Like the, it's more interesting in that way. Well, we have we all have so much to look forward to is um, whether we're first time readers of the Iliad or have spent a lot of time with it because we bear it, we haven't even really spoken about the very ending. Um, we touched on it with Priam and Achilles having some very beautiful human moments together, um, but we're a couple minutes over, so I wanted to give Dr. Thompson another chance just to to say any kind of final thoughts or questions you'd like students to approach Homer with any or advice anything you have. Yeah, usually the way we end our, our sessions at, at Tory is we'll take a question that encapsulates what we were exploring at the very end of session, and we ask it as what we call a poll question. And then we all go spend time writing 300 to 600 words on that question and kind of trying to land, um, uh, land our thoughts on that question. And so I really liked Victoria's question at the end um, that we were, we found, I think, provocative and and fresh in, in different ways and um invites us into a, a place in the text that we haven't got to fully explore so i think i would just ask as my poll question for the session um this in, in battling with hector um is achilles wrestling with it with his own humanity and battling with hector is achilles wrestling with his own humanity and sometimes we ask two or three poll questions and i'd maybe refer you back to um other questions I ask in the um, in the PowerPoint, but I, I really like that one that Victoria surfaced for us there at the end. That's fantastic. Um, thank you all. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Dr. Thompson, um, for your presentation and, and for the panelists, your thoughtful participation. 
It was really excellent. I think we all learned a lot. Thank you to all the panelists. Um, you guys, uh, you guys were were so helpful and with your insights and your questions. Really appreciate it. That's great. Let's all go read the Iliad. <laughs> um, thank you. Good night.